view. But we'll start out with looking at what failure to thrive is defined as. And it's defined as a state of inadequate growth in pediatrics. Uh, often it's the inability to use calories. And we can define it as a short term when we look at the weight below the fifth percentile for that child's age. And we define sh long term when the weight and the height fall below the fifth percentile for that age. And so it's important that in practice that you are looking at your growth charts and plotting children so that you can look at what their percentile is. When we look at failure to thrive, the actual patho and etiology is better understood if we look at the analysis of the caloric use. So to begin, we divide it into three different categories. The first is the inadequate caloric intake. So this means there's some reason why we can't get enough calories in. And it can be for things that are anatomical, like a cleft palate, micrognosia, someone's not um, their oral cavity is not developed properly. We also have feeding issues, um, things of um, the breastfeeding problems, poor technique, inverted nipples, um, improper formula preparation is also considered a feeding issue. Often families living in poverty will um, prepare the formula using too much water or they'll take formula and, and add water to it so that they are giving, having more feedings, but those feedings don't have enough calories per feeding. So then we can see that this child's not getting enough calories to maintain growth. Um, we often see too that at the six to 12 months transition to solid foods that that goes poorly. The child's not um, able to eat enough solid food um, to sustain growth in a normal pattern. And sometimes we have parental restrictions due to health concerns. Um, in practice, we had a client who's um, father died very early from heart disease and so the parent was restricting fats to their child which was resulting in failure to thrive so it um, can be a restricting from a parent because of a health concern and also just poor knowledge of nutrition and what a child how much a child should eat um, that newborn parent with a newborn may not always n know how much nutrition a child would need we also um, look at psychosocial problems poor mother-infant bonding and under this falls child neglect and abuse, emotional deprivation, and maternal mental health. Um, they all can impact the parent's ability to provide enough calories for that newborn. And then we do have neurologic um, reasons that we have difficulty getting enough nutrition in, and it can be oral motor control, hypotonia, lack of suck, suck coordination, or hydrocephalus. So those can all be um, considered inability to get enough calories in. The second category is inadequate caloric absorption. So we can get the calories in, but now we have difficulty with absorption. So non-absorption can be things like emesis, GERD, GI obstruction, and some metabolic disorders. Um, also in that, this category is malabsorption, and under that would be um, like chronic diarrhea, celiac disease, infections like Gardose, get geodiasis, cystic fibrosis, food insensitivities, um, protein losing, and enteropathies. Excessive juice intake is another one. Um, sometimes when toddlers are taking too much juice, it creates um, chronic diarrhea for them. It's also important that we look at what drugs the child may be taking because that may lend itself to malabsorption of certain nutrients. Um, atresias, hepatitis, and iron deficiencies are also reasons that would lend themselves to malabsorption. And it's important too that we are screening and evaluating for malignancy because that can also lend itself to um, malabsorption. Just important to note that the most common underlying medical condition is GERD and diarrhea for the pediatric population. And then the third is excessive caloric expenditure. We'll see this with um, congenital and or acquired heart disease. So we have a baby that has a congenital anomaly is working very hard to oxygenate, so they are burning a lot more calories. Um, we also see a high caloric expenditure with chronic hypoxia and pulmonary disease. Um, important that we're looking at hyperthyroidism and other metabolic disorders, immune deficiencies, and recurrent infection. Recent research has shown that children with chronic ear infections because of um, the metabolic dem demand on the body with infection, that those children can end up with a secondary diagnosis of failure to thrive. 
It is also important that we investigate some other underlying etiologies that could be the reason for a child not um, growing adequately. And one of those is increased lead levels. Um, lead absorption is increased when we have low iron and calcium levels, and that's seen in um, a child that has poor nutrition. Um, the other um, thing that's m to be mindful of is that we want to look at the parental interactions. And when we see a, this occurring with a child less than six months of age, it may it's often due to poor attachment. And if it's beyond six months, it may, may often be due to over-involved parents um, force feeding or having um, a poor intake um, response when they try to transition from um, bottle or breast milk to solid foods. So the clinical manifestations that we're going to look for is that we see a persistent failure to gain weight or lose, or a child who loses weight, um, and this is for a child under six. A child may present as irritable, difficult to soothe, um, have poor eating, they often have erratic sleep patterns, and they are going to fall below the expected growth patterns, and often are developmentally delayed. Um, so that's why it's very important for a nurse working in pediatrics to be very mindful of what the developmental milestones are and what the expected growth pattern is for each age group, especially in that first year of life. Um, child may present to be apathetic, withdrawn, demonstrate poor eye contact, and lacked the anticipated stranger anxiety. So normally we would see um, a child at nine months would be more um, afraid of strangers, and a child who's um, considered failure to thrive may often be more apathetic and not respond to a stranger. So our assessment has to really start with a complete history and physical exam. Um, based on the, reason, the different categories, we want to start to eliminate or try to figure out if there's any underlying conditions. Um, we want to do height, weight, BMI, and look at their child's percentiles. Um, it's important that we include a developmental assessment with a child looking at um, growth failure and because we want to make sure we identify if there's any um, delays that need to be addressed. Um, assessment for failure to thrive has to include a family assessment and, and this should include all caregivers. So if the baby or the um, child is in the care of a grandparent or a daycare provider, it's important that they are also included in the assessment. Um, we want to investigate stressors um, because if we're looking at if it's a parent bonding or there's other reasons why they're having difficulty with feeding, that needs to be investigated. We need to look at the pregnancy and the delivery history to find out um, if there were any issues or problems and how the family is adjusting to the newborn. And it's very important in the family assessment that we have an opportunity to observe parent and infant interactions. So for example, it would be important to plan a feeding to occur during the assessment and watch the family interacting and either playing or caregiving during that time so that we have the opportunity as an outsider to observe what's happening with the family dynamic. Obviously a, a dietary history is going to be important and that does include the observation of a feeding um, so that we can look at um, things that we may be picking up either for example a poor suck, lack of coordination, um, or just the way that the um, family is um, doing the feeding. So our nursing management is going to include that we document the growth retardation and that's important many um, times, especially for children living in um, poverty, they don't have regular visits. They will often just come in for a sick visit so they're not getting the healthy ones and then what happens is that it sort of gets missed that we are seeing a child who's not meeting the milestones for growth and development. So it's important that we're documenting um, growth and development throughout that first year of life so that we can pick up on those changes. Um, we want to rule out any physical or disease causes and address them and then want to look at modifying the diet and feeding patterns. Um, sometimes education to help families understand, you know, the reason for the concentration of a formula or the uh, frequency of doing breastfeeding and as a transition from from that um, to more solid foods it's important to help educate families about the, the uh, system a way to 
introduce new feeds and, and being patient and trying things even if the child does not seem to be enjoying it. Um, and so there's a lot to, that we need to do with family education about um, environment, providing a calm environment during eating, try to limit distractions. Um, it's often very important that we're linking families up with breastfeeding support because breastfeeding is the is the best and least expensive way to give baby good nutrition. So, um, but providing support for families is often where there's a challenge, um, especially if you have limited resources. Um, we may need to um, do supplemental feeds, and that can be through NG. And if it's child severely malnourished, then that would be a peg um, peg tube insertion would be required. And it's important that we include counseling, especially if it was for a parenting issue. The families often have a lot of guilt because they, um, not knowingly, but their baby is diagnosed with failure to thrive and may have developmental delays because of poor nutrition. It's important, too, that we, as we continue through the management, that we continue to evaluate, look at the growth and development to make sure that it's improving. And that's going to show, help us know that our interventions are working. Um, we want to see that the child's parent-child relationships improving if that's what was identified as an issue. And, um, you know, our major outcome is that we want to make sure that there are no long-term complications from the failure to thrive. So I've included here a couple, um, as I wrap up, some potential nursing diagnoses that you might see for a child who is diagnosed with failure to thrive. And the first is imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements related to inadequate intake of calories, or it could be, you know, excessive expenditure, whatever the diagnosis is best. Um, risk for delayed growth and development related to physical or emotional neglect, lack of stimulation, and insufficient nurturing. And the third is important too, is impaired parenting related to lack of knowledge and confidence in parenting skills. Good morning. Um,